Now, normally I like to talk about American victories, but today I want to tell you about the Battle of Camden. It was one of the worst, one of the biggest, in the immortal words of renowned psychiatrist, Dr. Leo Marvin. It was a disaster, Faye. August 16th, 1780 in South Carolina, the Battle of Camden took place. So Charles, Earl of Cornwallis, was the British general. He had fought in the revolution, went home, his wife passed away, then he asked to be transferred back to the war, which he didn't even really believe in. He thought, the Americans wanna have their own country, well, let them have their own country. But he came back and said, well, my heart is broken, I'd like to fight and forget my pain back in England. Now, he was a great general, and uh, even though he is most remembered for surrendering to Washington at Yorktown, he did very well in the American Revolution. He made all his mistakes in America. After the war, he went over and put down rebellions in India and in Ireland, and was governor of India, viceroy of Ireland, very formidable opponent. And on this day, he didn't make any mistakes. Now, Horatio Gates, the commander of the American troops, was an Englishman. He had joined the British Army a long time before, risen up through the ranks, was passed over for command because he was not of noble birth. He didn't have money to buy promotions, which was customary in the British Army at the time. And so he got passed over for command many times and said, I'm going to America and I'm gonna fight the British. Gates was a very likable fella and the Continental Congress absolutely loved him. They were happy to have him as a general. Some of the Congress even wanted him rather than Washington at the head of the army. He was also a very gullible man. General Charles Lee said, if you told him the French were ascending the Potomac mounted on crocodiles, he'd believe you. He had won the Battle of Saratoga against gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, but a lot of people thought it was because of Dan Morgan and Ben Arnold who were under him and not because of his generaling skills. Now he was in command of what he called the Grand Army, upwards of 7,000 men. One of his officers, General Williams said, I don't think we got 7,000. He went and counted and came up with 3,052. When he went and told Horatio Gates, Horatio Gates said, we'll fight them anyway. Tally ho! Now back in May, the English had taken Charleston, and then Henry Clinton, the general, had sailed back to New York, left Cornwallis in charge. Up in North Carolina, General Gates came down, took command, and heard, ooh, Lord Rawdon is down at Camden with only 800 men. I will go down, kick his tail, take control of the Carolinas, get Charleston back, win myself some glory. That is not at all how it ended up. In his haste to get there, General Gates did not properly supply his army, so they were eating green apples and green peaches, dried beef, and instead of giving the men rum or even water to drink, they would give them molasses. One of the officers on the way down said that on the road to Camden, men were constantly stepping out of formation in the woods to evacuate. It's a polite way of saying the guy had the green apple trots. Well, Cornwallis heard he was coming and raced from Charleston up the road to Camden. He only had around 2,200 men, but they were mostly regulars, as opposed to General Gates, who had mostly militia. Now, the British custom was to put the best units on your right flank. You would smash into the enemy's left. So Cornwallis did that. Horatio Gates, since he was British, he did the same thing. What happened was Cornwallis's very best under Colonel James Webster, the 33rd Welsh Fusiliers went smashing right into the Virginia regulars who, when they saw them coming, who's eyeing and pointing their bayonets, they took off running. They scattered like chickens and run for home. Now after Webster's Fusiliers pushed the militia off the field, rather than giving chase, they took a left turn and smashed right into Johann Kolb, who was putting up a fight on the right flank. General de Kolb was from Bavaria, and he had immigrated over here, found himself in the Continental Army. He fought right up until the end. He received 11 wounds on the field. There's a famous painting of him laying there with a British guy pointing a bayonet at him, and he died three days later. After the battle, Cornwallis actually came up to him said, I'm very sorry to see you're in such condition and gave him the very best medical treatment. Cornwallis was a gentleman. This battle was a disaster, not one of our finer hours. To make matters worse, Gates left the battlefield within a few minutes of it starting. When those 33rd regulars smashed the Virginia militia and they took off running, Gates was right behind them, passed them on his famous racehorse, and went all the way to Charlotte, North Carolina, over 60 miles away. On the way down, he passed two different guys. 
Colonel William Davy and Isaac Huger, and both of them said, hey, where are you going? And he said, all is lost, save yourselves. Wow. Davy turned to Huger and said, how far should we follow this guy's orders? Huger said, you can follow him as far as you want to, you're never gonna see him again. He was right. Gates was stripped of his command, and even though he wasn't court-martialed, he never held command again. His replacement, Nathaniel Green, ended up reorganizing the army and was the man that chased Cornwallis up to Yorktown where he surrendered. Camden is a good example of why you don't do things just because that's the way you've always done it. And it's also a good example of why you should listen to people that know more about a situation than you do, even if they're younger and have less experience.